Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. I forgot to say my last name. Did I forget my last name? Hmm. Enough about that. Folks, much more important, today's video topic, how to break through strength plateaus. And if you wanna know about how to break through muscle gain plateaus, don't you worry, that's the next video we're recording. It'll probably be out like next week or something. All right, so strength plateaus, how to break through them. You're in one, you're not getting stronger. It might be for your whole body. Usually it's just one lift at a time. What do you do about it? I've got 10 decent tips to try to troubleshoot. Here we go, number one. First, I know this is crazy. The first tip is to make sure there's actually a plateau to break. Some people, many people have told me over the years, Hey man, I'm like, my squat's really struggling. I'm like, oh no, like, hasn't improved for a while? Like, no, it goes up, but just slower than my deadlift. Okay. Well, you know, not all the lifts are supposed to go up at the same rate. A lot of that's just genetics. Like, oh, huh. Like, so how much have you gained in your squat? Like, well, over the past six months, I put 50 pounds on it. And I just want to be like, shut up. Some of us would die for gains like that. So a lot of times we don't make the beginner gains we used to, and they turn into intermediate gains, which are still fucking baller and steady fucking gains. You're not at a plateau. A plateau is when you don't make any gains for like a month at least on end, okay? Because week to week, your shit can go up and go down, no big deal. I would say my rule, just general rule of thumb, if you haven't gained any strength in like one whole mesocycle, like you test you know, before you do a cycle, cycle of a month or two, you test after, if there's been no change, you can consider it barely considered a plateau. And especially if you got to test in the right rep ranges too, because if you did lots of sets of five to 10, you got to test five to 10 or five to 10 pre and post, because that's probably going to improve. You test maxes, you're just not peaked for a max. So make sure there's a plateau. If it's just slower gains, you can use some of these to enhance your gains, but that's a very different discussion than it's just not working, right? Point number two, huge point. Make sure your nutrition, your relaxation and your sleep is in line. We have tons of videos on RP already about what that means. Go look for them. There's tons of videos all over the internet, tons of articles. We have a whole recovery book at RP, uh, Recovering from Training, it's called. You can buy it. It's like 30 bucks or something. It's going to tell you everything you need to know about nutrition, relaxation, and sleep for recovery. Don't even bother with anything else until these are sorted. When I talk to folks in the gym, they say, hey, look, my strength is stalling. One of the first things I'll ask them if I'm being thorough is how is your nutrition, relaxation, and sleep? And they're like, man, actually, I'm getting a divorce with my wife and I've been so anxious I can't eat. And I'm just like, okay, anything I tell you about your training is going to be relevant because you're not supplying the training with proper fuel, nor are you allowing the training processes to execute themselves in an environment of a high degree of rest and relaxation. That's how gains happen. So what you have to have is I don't care what your program is, if you're getting decent nutrition, sleep, and relaxation, sweet. Let's talk about your program. If you're not, I don't care what your program is, right? It's like telling me like, hey, like uh, my race car won't go any faster. You guys like the really race, stupid race car analogies I come up with? My race car won't go any faster. And I'm like, okay, uh, what kind of engine should I upgrade? I'm like, okay, what's your current engine? I say some kind of RTEC V this and that. And I'm like, oh, sweet. Sounds reasonable. Should be going faster than what you tell me. I'm like, How, what kind of tires are you using? Well, that's the thing, like uh, missing a couple tires. So I'm only actually have two wheels on my car right now. <laughs> Why are you talking about speed? Are you crazy? Get four fucking wheels on your car and then the engine matters, not the other way around, all right? So really, really, really big deal. Point number three is not this magic thing that'll solve all the problems. It just has to be, It's it just happens to be a huge commonality. So you watching this video right now, there's a decent chance you have this problem because a lot of people don't know what deloading is. They just don't know that fatigue accumulates over time and they reach a situation where they're under the hood, their gains are actually great, but the fitness gains go like this and the fatigue gains go like that. And all of a sudden they're either plateaued or getting weaker and they don't know why. The quality of the training is actually really good. They're training fucking hard. They're training right, but the fatigue has just gotten out of hand. Look, I went through like maybe five or six years of training before I even heard what a deload was. I just didn't even know what it was. I would just auto deload back and I felt shitty enough. I would just show up to the gym a little less and I'd be tired. So I'd leave or I'd go on vacation and then my fatigue would drop. But a lot of people are super hardcore, super dedicated. They won't do shit like that. I didn't do shit like that for years. Deload because cumulative fatigue is a huge factor. You may actually fix everything in your training just by deloading. So a lot of times when people are training super hard and if you talk to someone about their plateau, a lot of times it's a hardcore dedicated people. Look, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I up my volume, blah, blah, blah. And they'll say, take a really easy week. Here's how to do it. And we have tons of videos about how to deload on RP already. Check those out. They do it and they're like, come back and they just fucking hit PR after PR after PR. They just have too much cumulative fatigue. Give it a shot. If you've never deloaded before, it's almost certainly gonna make you a shitload stronger. 
Point number four, you want to make sure that the amount of training volume you're doing is your adaptive window between your minimum effective volume and your maximum recoverable, between the minimum you need to do to actually cause robust adaptations and get better, and is not so high that it is exceeding what your body can regularly recover from, and thus is totally pointless for you to do and probably a real bad idea. How do you do that? The best way to do it is probably just take whatever you're doing now, cut it by half. Do half of what you're doing, a lot less, like half the number of working sets per week. Let's say you bench 10 working sets of bench per week, go to five. No joke. Deload, then go to five. And you'll be like, what? Five? That's bullshit. A lot of people do too much, especially in strength. And hypertrophy, it's something the, the other way around. Usually they don't do enough. In strength, they're often doing too much. You go to half the volume, and then you do a whole mesocycle of training, whole training cycle, deal it after, test your strength again by just training normally. If you've gotten stronger, you're definitely within that window of minimum effective volume to maximum recoverable. Awesome. And then you can try to play around with that window, but fundamentally, the volume's probably not the problem, right? On the other hand, if you get there and you don't make any gains, it's not enough training volume. And then you up the volume a little, go from five sets to like seven sets on average in the next training block or next mesocycle, see how that works. Slowly, you'll find your minimum effective to maximum recoverable window. You just have to because it exists and it is somewhere. But what a lot of people find is they'll go from like 15 all the way to like seven and they get the best gains of their lives because they've just been overdoing it. Some people, they'll go from, you know, they were doing 10 and they were getting okay gains or maybe no gains at all. They go to five and those gains disappear altogether. And then they slowly add more volume and they notice between 12 and 22 sets per week, they get their best gains. Either way, once you know that, this is a value that stays roughly pretty stable through years and years of your career. So once you find your volume landmarks, then you know them and you don't ever have to make that mistake again, at least in grand style. The reason this is important is a lot of people just don't know how much volume they need, and it's a big difference value between tons of people. You could be deadlifting too much, squatting too much, benching not enough, and you have no idea because you copied your program from the internet. Nothing wrong with that, but it's time to tailor it to yourself by exploring different levels of volume and seeing which one is the right fit for you that gives you the best results. Point number five, are you building strength or are you just testing it? Okay, a lot of people, the big mistake they make is they just do 1RM tests all the time. They work up to a single, and sometimes they don't do much else. They do a single and a triple, and they go home. Strength is built best with multiple sets of three to six reps. That's what builds strength. So a lot of times, the way to break through a plateau, and this is how people get themselves into plateaus, is they'll test their max all the time, and it goes up just because that testing is sufficiently voluminous and, and intense for them to make gains. Then they get past their beginner period, and it turns out you just need more work, submaximal hardcore grinder reps, rather than just showing off. Showing off is just not making you good anymore. And they think, damn it, I've hit a plateau. Like, I used to, my max used to go up every week. And a lot of times when they say shit like, my max used to go up every week, it's like, motherfucker, how do you know that? Yo, you testing your max every week? And they're like, yeah. We're not supposed to be doing that anyway. Get away from the testing and get into the training. Lots of sets of three to six reps. And then afterwards, a couple months later, you test your max and holy shit, it went up by a ton because you're no longer just trying shit out. You're actually doing it. The bodybuilding analogy would be like, instead of flexing in the mirror, which if you flex hard enough and you're a beginner, will actually make you more jacked and checks your muscles. Why don't you actually train, train for a while. Then the next time you flex in the mirror, you'll be much more impressive, right? Point number six recalibrate your relative effort. Maybe you're training not hard enough, right? So your mesocycle should start at an RP7 or so, not an RP5 or 6. If I look at your reps and I don't know if it's a technique only session or a recovery session, or if it's actually a hard session, you have a problem. On the other hand, if you're doing RP10 all the time and grinding everything to failure, then you're probably generating a huge amount of fatigue with a decent amount of stimulus, but the fatigue after multiple weeks overwhelms it and you get into the situation where you either have to deal it all the time or you are on a plateau. Most of your good training is going to be uh, uh, between RP 7 and 10 with an average of like 8 or 9 RP. So most of your sets should be hard, challenging, but doable and recoverable so you can come again and again and again. That takes some wiggle room and takes some work to figure out, but it's worth figuring out because you may be training too hard per set or you may be training too easy. Number seven, technique. A lot of times the reason your bench isn't going up is because you're benching all wrong, you're squatting all wrong, you're deadlifting all wrong, or maybe not all wrong, but you could be doing it a whole lot better. The thing is, don't just try a new technique and be like, oh man, my max went down. Anything new is different for your nervous system, which means total output, even if it's more efficient of a technique, it's more effective, could go down or just be the same. You have to take an objectively better technique, working with a coach is a great idea, maybe watching a bunch of like Johnny Candido videos or something is a really good start, getting your technique really, really solid, and practicing that new technique, that better technique, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And in the first few weeks, you may get nothing out of it. But then weeks later, you're like, oh my shit, and there's this huge wave of gains. 
I was bench pressing when I was like 16 years old. I was doing 225 for reps. I weighed like 160 or something. And I was benching completely flat backed. And this gentleman at the Jewish community center where I was benching was a competitive power lifter. And he was an old, much older guy. He was in his fifties or sixties. His name was Bill. And he, he was like, Hey, like you, you're pretty talented in the bench press. Did you know that? And I was like, Oh, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm trying my best. And he's like, you know, would you like to learn how to bench press properly? And I knew who he was. And I was like, Yes. So he taught me how to arch and retract. Just a little bit of an arch and a little bit of a retraction. And I, at first, my bench went down because it's fucking awkward, right? You just want to fucking push, right? You don't want to fucking do this, like weird penguin dance. But I believed him. I knew he knew what he was doing. He benched way more than me. And after that, first couple of weird, awkward, like Bambi newborn deer leg benching, my bench started going up and up and up and my technique got even better. I got really settled into how to really pull my shoulder blades and really push that chest out. Holy shit, it launched the rest of my bench pressing, which was you know monumentous compared to what it used to be. So invest in that time to let the technique express itself. Don't just be like, fuck, in two weeks later, it didn't fucking work, I'm done. Don't do shit like that because then you'll just calibrate between various techniques and never amount to shit. Number eight, hypertrophy. A lot of people that are obsessed with strength train sets of three to six all the time, sets of one to three, that's fine. And they end up just running out of muscle to improve to being stronger, okay? Like on a car engine, a certain engine, like a V6, there's only so much tuning you can do to get power out of a V6. At some point, you just don't get much out of it. Now, you can always tune it a little better, but then you're getting five horsepower here, 10 here, three horsepower there. At some point, if you want to really, really fast, you need a V8, you need a V10, you need a V12. You just need a bigger engine. Just the same way, at some point, you got to get more jacked, bro. Like if you look at all the best power lifters, what does Dan Green say? No skinny champions? Eh, they're few and far between, okay? You just need muscle, period. So what you can do is you take two to four mesocycles, which means like, you know, three to six months or something like that. That's a fucking long time. It's not two weeks, right? And you gain size by training mostly in the five to 10 rep range with food, in a hypercaloric state where you are gaining some weight because the muscle needs to be made of shit. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. Then after that, you take another two to four months, you may come back and because you're so used to sets of five to 10, you might be temporarily weaker, especially if you're advanced. I know, don't hate me, don't throw the remote at your TV screen. Wait, do two to four mesocycles, again, another three to six months of strength training foundationally sets of three to six reps. You're gonna take that new muscle you just built with sets of five to 10 over multiple months and you're gonna make it strong as fucking shit, getting that muscle to change its architecture a little bit to become more efficient and effective at producing force, getting the nervous system to recruit it better, more dynamically, more athletically in coordination with other muscles. Once you do that, your lifts are gonna fucking skyrocket. So if you've run out of tricks and you look at yourself and you're like, I am, compared to the average 100 kilo lifter, I'm like six inches taller, not as jacked. Looks like you need to move up a class, gain that weight, and all of your strength problems are gonna be solved. Can you imagine if someone who weighed 120 pounds was like, I'm gonna be the next Eddie Hall. So I'm gonna deadlift heavy and press heavy and do Viking presses. It's gonna be great. Like, all right, uh, you're gonna gain some weight? Like, no, uh, like Eddie Hall got strong by doing technique. And it's like, oh uh, yeah, that helped. But for the love of fucking God, Eddie Hall at his prime was like 424 pounds. There's no way to change that out. So at the end of the day, the most foundational element of strength is size. And if you're really at a loss for why your bench won't go up, you need bigger pecs and triceps. Problem solved. Number nine, second to last tip, frequency. Generally speaking, the best average range of frequency to train the same movement or muscle groups to get stronger is like two to four hard sessions for that movement pattern or muscle per week. Okay, so if you're training once a week and your bench won't go up, you're training your bench and chest once a week, don't be surprised. If you're training six times a week, it could really work fast at some point, but it could be unsustainable and too fatiguing in the long term, right? So if you did the squat every day program and you got super strong and then you hit a plateau, do less for a while. If you've been lifting once, maybe twice a week for the same muscle groups, maybe you squat twice a week, try squatting three times a week for a while and you almost certainly get stronger. And then later go up to four and you'll almost certainly get stronger and then go back to two to give the body a break. Really good idea to think about. Lastly, exercise selection. If you've just been doing the same movements for longer than like six months on end, your body could be really used to them and they could be getting a little bit stale. Switch up the movements a bit. Get away. Let's say you've been doing low bar squat, low bar squat, low bar squat. Understandably, you're a power lifter. You've been doing that for six months straight and not another single fucking squat movement. Literally, either just do them light, 
do them just once a day out of the three squat days you have, or don't do them at all, and, re and replace them with some front squats or some leg presses or hack squats and some high bar squats. And do those shits for two or three mesos on end. So for another like six months, you're gonna build those lifts up. They're gonna be novel. They're gonna be fresh. They're gonna build muscle. They're gonna build strength. Then when you come back, to the low bar squat or to the lift that you got rid of or de-emphasized, it's going to be new, it's going to be fresh and working with a bigger strength base and a bigger muscle base and all of a sudden it's going to go back up. Really, really easy. Because we all think that, okay, I want to get stronger at this, I want to do it really well, I'm going to invest all my time in it. Sometimes moving away from it is the best thing to actually enhance those gains, right? And of course, the alternate movements, you want to pick them to target similar muscles and functions. So we don't want you to like, stop low bar squatting and not high bar squat or hack squat or something like that. Don't just do like leg extensions because that misses 90% of the muscles you're using in the squat. Uh, make sure it's a very similar movement. Foundationally, it's still the compound pushing movement of the legs in this case, but it's okay if it's, if it's different and sometimes it's actually the better way if the movement is getting stale. Now, to that frequency end, not training frequency exactly, but frequency of when you do the exercise. If your low bar squat isn't going up and you squat three times a week, one of them is a low bar session, one is a high bar session, one is a hack squat session, you're doing a general good job of getting stronger and probably a lot of good hypertrophy, but the nervous system works on practice and technique is huge in strength. So what you might be able to do is for a short time, maybe six to eight weeks, squat low bar if your shoulders and everything can handle it without injury, squat low bar twice a week instead of once a week, or even three times a week. The amount of practice that you do ends up making you stronger just on neural grounds. A lot of getting strong is practicing lift. Olympic weightlifters don't get a good at clean and jerks because they don't ever do them. They do them all the fucking time, and that's how they get so good at them in addition to being strong under the hood and being muscular. Real big deal, real good thing to try. Now, you may say to yourself, like, there's no fucking way I can low bar squat heavy three times a week. Might not have to be heavy. What you might do is low bar squat heavy one day, moderate another day, and the last squatting day, you can do heavy high bar squats or hack squats to get some good heavy stimulus, but still low bar squat later in the workout at the end, super light just for techniques. That's a three to six at like 50% of your one rep max. Not challenging, but it lets you get into the groove and practice the movement so that next Monday when you come back, uh, back in and you low bar squat heavy, you're super fucking grooved into low bar squatting because you've been practicing with light weights, which absolutely works. That way you can get really strong really fast. You can forget about your plateaus. And eventually when you're not plateauing anymore and you're getting really good gains and you're at that cocktail party and no one's talking to you, someone comes up to you and you're like, oh, <clears throat> hello. And they're like, have you been making gains in your squat lately? Because I follow you on Instagram. You're like, um, <laughs> Yeah, I guess I have. And all of a sudden, you're married with children. Your life is amazing. That's how to find happiness, folks. Break those plateaus. Tell me how it goes. Comment in the comments below. And if you want hypertrophy, plateau breaking tips. See you next week.